Well, I think the big challenge is to try and look at feeding a nine billion uh, human world and therefore you're looking at things like scarce resources like water and access to particularly clean water and the capability of sustaining a food chain that's capable of delivering uh, to the demands that are emerging in countries as we know like Asia uh, the demand for proteins there is becoming higher and higher and even parts of Africa and the Middle East so the, the real challenge is how you do that on a sustainable basis. The reality is that if global population continues at the rate we're seeing, what you will have is scarcity of food, even in countries like Ireland where we're a food exporting country. Uh, and we see microcosms of that even this year, where in the liquid milk market, uh, the domestic market here has been very difficult and very unresponsive. And there's actually a better return for farmers and for milk processors in milk, making milk powders, either for the Middle East or for China. So that trend continues over a period of time and you have no liquid milk market in Ireland. So it's, it's as dramatic as that. Well, the demand is there and it's very, very strong. So the question really is, what are the supply capabilities to feed it? I mean, there would have been a view, I suppose, in the 80s and 90s that Europe uh, could afford to reduce food production, that there were food production sources, particularly Brazil emerging, uh, and in dairy products, the likes of New Zealand. So there was a notion that in a mature economy like Europe, you didn't really need to have an emphasis on food production, that you had these global sources. Now, I think the reality, that was never real, and it's certainly not real now. So the demand in emerging countries is greater than the current supply capability, so that even on an idealized way, New Zealand can not feed the Chinese demand, never mind the emerging demand right across the world. So what that requires then is a much more planned and, uh, I suppose, balanced approach uh, to sustainable food production. What you have is a combination of things. You have deregulation of markets. So the European CAP, that used to be quite rigid, is being deregulated. The US has reduced its supports. And, and what you have on top of that is extreme weather volatility. So what in, you know, if you take even dairy production in the last two or three years, the big drivers have been our own uh, winter and spring this year. At the same time as we were experiencing that, there was a drought in the US. Uh, which affected their milk production at the same time as that was happening there was a drought in New Zealand so you have weather events causing spikes in prices leading to shortages in supermarkets of basic products like bread and even milk at times so it's very real there was in, in, in previous times a sense that there's an isolation piece here that things could happen in Ireland and they didn't impact on the rest of the world or things that happen in the rest of the world didn't impact on Ireland now the demand is global, the supply base reacts globally and you're going to get scarcities. Well, I, I suppose historically when you get uh, a development in middle class demand uh, that in increases demand not just for basic foodstuffs but for milk proteins and meat proteins and that's where I suppose the big surge comes and uh, as I say you look at the demand in, in Asia, you look at the, the numbers, I think it's something like in, in the last five years, 300 million people have gone from being subsistence, working class, if you like, peasant farmers in China into becoming part of a middle class. And there's a huge surge then in demand for, uh, for branded food products, because that's part of the status view that people take when they move into the middle class. And I suppose it, from an Irish perspective, that's been most represented by the demand for infant formula from China. It's absolutely gangbusters in lots of ways in terms of the demand for the product. At the moment one job in eight in the Irish economy is linked to food production. So it's a huge driver of economic value and I suppose more importantly uh, the supply chain is in Ireland. A lot of the industries that we have that are foreign direct investment in Ireland their supply chain is elsewhere so you know when they grow the Irish economy doesn't grow whereas food and agriculture is deeply embedded buys its inputs in the Irish economy and therefore when there's growth there there's Irish economy growth so this is really a huge uh, opportunity for Ireland and we see that uh, that in you know t the period from 2015 to 2020 we will probably increase milk production by at least 50 percent uh, we will see increases in in beef and other meat productions of between 20 and 30 percent and as importantly increases in the values of the exports uh, you know, as the demand for these things grow. So it's a huge driver of economic growth in Ireland. And as I said, the key piece to it, uh, which was missed I think in, in, you know, in previous notions about where agriculture and food stood in Ireland is, the supply chain is in Ireland.
you're buying ingredients and inputs from your neighbour and you're putting money back into the Irish economy. Like typically, food and drink sector would turn over 30 billion euros totally. Of that, somewhere between 22 and 24 billion actually goes back into the Irish economy. That's the most significant, uh, if you like, Irish economy expenditure right across. If you take the, the, the foreign direct investment piece, they may well turn over 40 or 50 billion in Ireland, but they wouldn't spend more than 6 billion in Ireland because they don't buy the raw materials here.